वेलकम लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन टू द सीमा एस सी एस पी थ्री कंप्लीट एसेंशियल रिविशन सेगमेंट नंबर फाइव दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सेगमेंट इट्स गोइंग टू बी स्लाइटली हैवी ड्यूटी ऑल्सो बिकॉज देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ इंफॉर्मेशन दैट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट यू नो वॉट इट इज द ऑल इंपॉर्टेंट कॉपरेट गवर्नेंस लेट्स टेक अ लुक before we get started a kind reminder on my suggestions uh, please have a notebook and pen on the ready follow the slides and my explanation carefully make notes as you deem necessary maintain a list of key topics that you feel you're weak at so you can self revise later and maintain a list of key performance and management tools that can help you model answers in the case study exam a quick reminder of the co activities because the holy grail of marking For the examiner, uh, as you can see, uh, D and E. D is on evaluating and mitigating risk. E is on recommending and maintaining a sound control environment. So, uh, if you pay attention, within E, recommending and maintaining a sound control environment right, after establishing internal controls, respond to threats of poor governance. This is what uh, the bulk of the discussion. that we have today or we have on this segment is going to be on right so let's get started corporate governance this is generally described as the system by which companies are directed and controlled in the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders governance regulations have developed largely as a result of a series of corporate failures in the 1980s and early 1990s the corporate governance themes that began to emerge from these collapses were poorly run companies especially companies with a board of directors dominated by a single chair or chief executive figure and companies with severe agency problems then you had companies with poor financial reporting raising questions about auditing and internal control systems then an apparent lack of interest by major investment institutions in the performance of the companies in which they invested so because of these three fundamental reasons or the themes uh, so many things went wrong major scandals that led to corporate governance prominence so just a few examples uh, you know the entire life uh, of maxwell communications corporation enron bearings bank worldcom parmalat equitable life vw and even the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis are good examples of poor corporate governance not only at a individual level not only at a personal or an or a company level but multinational and transnational and uh, even economic macroeconomic level uh, kind of explains uh, how important corporate governance is doesn't it now we are looking at principles of good corporate governance primarily the uk code of corporate governance the code is constantly evolving and in the most recent update the principles of the uk corporate governance code relate to the following areas firstly board leadership and company purpose secondly division of responsibilities next composition succession and evaluation both audit risk and internal control and fifth remuneration so board leadership and company purpose division of responsibilities composition succession and evaluation audit risk and internal control and remuneration these are the five key areas that the uk's corporate governance code stresses upon let's take a look at uh, each of them because it's very very important and uh, it would be very prudent if you remember the five all right firstly board leadership and company purpose the board should be responsible for setting the purpose values and strategy of the company and making sure the culture is aligned with them the members of the board should lead by example with regard to the culture of their organization and behave with integrity the board must make sure appropriate resources are available to help the company meet its objectives and review performance the board has responsibility for ensuring that a satisfactory dialogue with shareholders and stakeholders takes place 
and should engage with them and encourage participation from them. You would have noticed one of the themes was that uh, apparent lack of uh, interest. So agents, uh, agents as the board, as the boards are the agents of the shareholders, must encourage their participation. The board should consider the strategy upon which the company intends to generate wealth over the longer term and report on both opportunities and risks to the continued success of the business. The board should pay particular attention to the workforce and assess if the culture is appropriate for the policies and procedures that are aligned to the company's purpose, values and strategy. And the board should seek to identify any conflicts of interest and ensure there is no compromise the company's ability to achieve its objectives. And the directors should record any concerns they have about the operations of the board in the board minutes. The meeting minutes sometimes even as a reference material in your paper and a formal whistleblowing policy should be in place for the workforce to raise concerns in confidence and if desired anonymously any concerns should be reviewed and followed up on by the board so board the, the board of directors they are they have a fundamental role to play to ensure that good governance is established within the company. They are the crux, they are the capstone of good governance. Next, division of responsibilities. There should be a clear division of responsibilities and no single individual should have unfettered powers of decision. So, you should have a clear division of responsibilities between running the board that is the chairperson's role and the executive responsibility for running the company's business that is the role of the CEO. The roles of chair of the board and the CEO should not be held by the same individual based on the UK Board of Governance. The chair is responsible for leadership of the board and ensuring its effectiveness and the non-executive directors should constructively challenge and help develop proposals on strategy. There we go. That is the fundamental role of NEDs. All right. So let's pay attention to the chairpersons or the chairmans, the chair of the board. What is uh, the chair's responsibilities? For example, the chair must provide leadership to the board, supplying vision and imagination and work closely with the CEO. Take a leading role in determining the composition and structure of the board which will involve regular assessment of the size of the board, balance between EDs and NEDs, EDs meaning executive directors and NEDs meaning non-executive directors. Uh, also the interaction, harmony and effectiveness of the directors. Set the board's agenda and plan board meetings. There are all board meetings directing debate toward consensus. Ensure the board receives appropriate, accurate and timely and clear information. Facilitate effective contribution from NEDs. Hold meetings with the NEDs without the executive directors present. Chair the AGM and other shareholders meetings. And using these to provide effective dialogue with shareholders. Discuss governance and major strategy with the major shareholders. Ensure that the views of the shareholders are communicated to the board as a whole. These are some example responsibilities of the chairperson, well basically uh, all the fundamental responsibilities are mentioned. Now let's take a look at the CEO, the person who runs the company on the board. What, are, what is the CEO's responsibility? Developing and implementing policies to execute the strategy established by the board, assuming full accountability to the board for all aspects of company operations, controls and performance, manage financial and physical resources, Build and maintain an effective management team. Put adequate operational financial planning, risk and internal control systems in place. Closely monitor operations and financial results in accordance with plans and budgets. Act as an interface, interface between board and employees. Assist in selection and evaluation of board members. Assist, not select, assist. Uh, because anyway the CEO is the leader. Uh, so obviously, you know, the people who are hired must be in, in well, CEO must be able to work with them. 
uh, represent the company to major suppliers, customers, and professional associations. Right. Those are some example responsibilities of the CEO. Let's uh, take a look at NED's responsibilities now. Non-executive. Look, there is one thing that I want to mention at the at this point itself. Look, now there are so many things about NEDs, the non-executive directors, uh, that get tested. But there is only one thing that you have to understand uh, in being confident that you are able to address NED related tasks. That is to understand what does a NED do, what is a NED's role, what threatens the independence of NED, and and basically who is an NED. So my suggestion is for you to think that if you were an NED to apply all this knowledge that you are going to learn, okay, if I was an NED, what is the role I am playing? When you have a sound understanding of who you are as an NED, what you are supposed to do, then tackling those questions are very, very easy. The proven technique, I am telling you, to grasp the knowledge in a way that you will understand what the role means, not try to memorize you know a few points here and there about what's good what's bad what to do what not to do no understand the role that would be the easiest way to deal with NEDs all right the non-executive directors should scrutinize the performance of management in meeting agreed goals and objectives and monitor the reporting of performance the board should consist of half independent NEDs excluding the chair yeah, for good board balance but the board is small, uh, then you know you can have slight deviations uh, and still have a balanced board. One NED should be the senior independent director who is directly available to shareholders if they have concerns which cannot or should not be dealt with through the appropriate channels of chair, CEO, or finance director. So, what does a NED do? What is the role of an NED? There are four ways we can look at this. The strategy role, contributing to development of strategy. The scrutinizing role, that is reviewing the performance of management in meeting objectives. The people role, deciding remuneration of the board and ensure appropriate succession planning. And the risk role, financial systems, checks, accuracy and risk management, robustness. Advising on those elements. These are the fundamental or the primary roles of NE. Brilliant. Now that you know the roles of NEDs, let's take a look at effectiveness. For NEDs to be effective, they must build a recognition by executives of their contribution in order to promote openness and trust because they play an advisory guidance role. So for EDs to trust their word, they should build that recognition, that credibility. Be well informed about the company and the external environment in which it operates have a strong command of issues relevant to the business. Insist on a comprehensive, formal and tailored induction. Continually develop and refresh their knowledge and the skills to ensure that their contribution to the board remains informed and relevant. Ensure that information is provided sufficiently in advance of meetings to enable thorough consideration of the issues facing the board. And insist that information is sufficient, accurate, clear and timely as much as possible upload the or uphold apologies uphold the highest ethical standards of integrity and probity probing question intelligently debate constructively challenge rigorously and decide dispassionately NEDs must do these four i'll repeat question intelligently Debate constructively, challenge rigorously, and decide dispassionately. And promote the highest standards of corporate governance and seek compliance with the provisions of the combined code wherever possible. These are what makes the NED role effective. Right. Now, a, a common term that we hear associated with NEDs are independence, in, or rather is independence, independent NEDs. So, why do we say that NEDs it's good when NEDs are independent? Now, you know the 
what the role is supposed to do, right? So if they are biased, do you think the functionality of the role will serve its purpose? Not really. That is the primary reason. Why NED independence matters is because they provide or they need to provide a detached and objective view of the board decisions to provide expertise and communicate effectively, to provide shareholders with an independent voice on the board, to provide confidence in corporate governance, to reduce accusations of self-interest in the behavior of executives. These are all reasons why and, and basically why it's so important for NEDs to be independent. But it doesn't mean that there are you know, not the occasions where NED independence is threatened. There can be non-independent uh, because independence is an extent matter. It's not like black and white. Right? The level of independence that could vary in terms of degree. Right? It can be very high, uh, it can be minimal, etc. So rather than pinpointing this is independent, this is non-independent, what we try to do is we try to understand what would threaten independence. And these are what could threaten independence, uh, situations in which NEDs are likely not to be independent. What are these situations? If the member has served on the board for more than nine years, if it's a significant shareholder, if the NED has close family ties with the directors, if the NED receives other remuneration from the company besides the director's fee, and if the NED has a material business relationship with the company in the last three years, or if the NED has been an employee in the last five years, or if the NED has a cross directorship in other companies, especially if the other company relates to the same kind of industry, but in general also, then the independence of the NED has reduced. To what degree? Depends on the situation. To be slightly reduced uh, or like highly ethical people like people who are well trained because independence is not something that you can just think or say you know I'm independent so I am uh, it doesn't work like that uh, uh, people who are heavily trained of being independent for a very long time duration they are the ones who you can rely on to be truly independent or else uh, this is definitely always going to be uh, a little uh, volatile the degree of dependence so now you know what threatens ned independence now uh, second was uh, division of responsibilities now we look at the third element composition succession and evaluation so there should be a formal procedure for the appointment of new directors to the board and an appropriate succession plan for the board and senior management the board and its committees should have the appropriate balance of skills, experience, independence and knowledge. All directors should be able to allocate sufficient time to the company to discharge their responsibilities effectively. All directors should be subject to an annual evaluation regarding whether they are contributing appropriately. There should also be an annual review of the board's composition and how effective the members of the board are at working together to achieve company objectives and diversity. All directors should be submitted for re-election at regular intervals subject to continued satisfactory performance. And there should be a formal, rigorous and transparent procedure for the appointments of new directors to the board, the nominations committee obviously. There should be a formal and thorough review of the board performance including chair, committees and individual directors on an annual basis. You see a lot of uh, annual term being used, right? Annual, annual reviews, uh, annual basis. Finally, the chair is responsible for acting on the results of the review, including celebrating the strengths and improving the weaknesses identified. Here, you have the key elements or rather key factors, key points to note under composition, succession and evaluation. So we came across the idea of nomination committee under that. The main responsibilities and duties of the nominations committee are to review regularly the structure, size and composition of the board and make recommendations to the board. Consider the balance between executives and NEDs on the board of directors. Ensure appropriate management of diversity to board composition. Provide an appropriate balance of power 
to reduce domination in executive selection by the CEO or the chair, regularly evaluate the balance of skills, knowledge and experience of the board, give full consideration to succession planning for directors, prepare a description of the role and capabilities required for any particular board appointment including that of the chair. Identify and nominate for the approval by the board candidates to fill board vacancies as and when they arise. Make recommendations to the board concerning the standing for reappointment of directors. Be seen to operate independently for the benefit of shareholders. And the work that the nomination committee does should be included in the annual report. And so the process for success, succession planning, board evaluation methods, diversity policy, the gender split, etc., uh, all should be included in the annual report, part of the uh, reporting aspect of corporate governance. That brings me to the audit function. We will take a closer look at, and there's a separate segment. Uh, in fact, it will be a two part segment on audit, internal audit itself. But let's here we are introduced first to the audit function and the importance of it you clearly see it embedded within corporate governance. So the audit function is there to monitor the integrity of the financial statements of the company and any formal announcements relating to the company's financial performance, reviewing significant financial reporting judgments contained on them. It is a primary function of the audit team. Uh, so if asked by the board, now mind you, it's, it's not purely, we are talking about the audit function in general. Right. It's not internal, it's not external yet. We will be looking at uh, both closely. But the overall audit function, what does audit mean? So secondly, if asked by the board to provide appropriate guidance about if the annual report is fair, balanced and clear enough for the shareholders to assess the company's performance and strategy. To review the company's internal financial controls and unless expressly addressed, by a separate board risk committee composed of independent directors or by the board itself, the audit function can review the company's internal control and risk management systems. Even when we looked at risk management earlier, in one of the previous segments, uh, we know that it could be either the audit committee that can absorb the work of uh, the risk committee or you can have a separate risk committee. To monitor and review the effectiveness of the company's internal audit function and if there is not one to consider if there is a need for one on an annual basis make the appropriate recommendation to the board that will be decided by the audit function or the audit committee. To make recommendations to the board for it to put to the shareholders for their approval in general meeting in relation to the appointment, reappointment and removal of the external auditor that's why I said it's not only internal external, external, everything, right? The audit committee, the audit function overall looks at, oversees all of that. Uh, removal of the external auditor and to approve the remuneration and terms of engagement of the external auditor. To review and monitor the external auditor's independence and objectivity and the effectiveness of the audit process, taking into consideration relevant UK professional re and regulatory requirements and to develop and implement policy on the engagement of the external auditor to supply non-audit services at all. Taking into account relevant ethical guidelines regarding the provision of non-audit services by the external audit firm and to report to the board identifying any matters in respect of which it considers that action or improvement is needed and making recommendations as to the steps to be taken. All of this will be part and parcel of the audit function overseen by the or managed by the audit committee. So risk management and internal control which is the fourth element. The board are responsible for carrying out a thorough review of both emerging risks and the key risks that have been identified as either likely or that have a significant impact on the competitive strategy reputation or future performance of the company or both. The board should incorporate in the annual report a description of the key risk, the risk register, the processes in place to identifying emerging risks and how these risks are being dealt with. 
the board should at least annually conduct a review of the effectiveness of the company's risk management and internal control systems and should report to shareholders that they have done so. The review should cover all material controls including financial, operational and compliance controls. All of those. The board should also state whether they consider it appropriate to use the going concern basis of accounting in preparing the financial statements and making it clear if there are any uncertainties over the company's ability to continue to operate like that into the future and meet the obligations as they fall due, including if you have any assumptions in reaching that conclusion. So the, the, that last point is, is so critical because it is the board's responsibility that they keep an eye on or rather they manage the company to be a going concern and ensure that uh, any kind of uncertainties, anything that worries them is clearly communicated to the relevant parties and uh, they take everything, they do everything in their power to be good agents on behalf of the shareholders. Um, there we go. Then we talk about remuneration. Uh, levels of remuneration should be appropriate to the strategy and lead to long-term sustainable success. No director should be able to decide their own remuneration. There should be a clear process to the policy for establishing the remuneration of directors and senior management. Directors should exercise discretion and consider wider business issues, the performance of the company and how the individual has performed when authorizing remuneration levels. The committee should be made up of at least three or in the case of smaller companies, two independent non-executive directors, the, the remuneration committee. And this committee should have delegated responsibility for setting remuneration for all executive directors and the chair, including pension rights and any compensation payments. Obviously, you know, it would be a little um, hypocritical if the remuneration committee themselves decide what their salaries are going to be. Uh, however, the remuneration committee should consider overall company remuneration policy, the approach to rewards and incentives and the impact on culture when setting director remuneration. And remuneration should align with creating long-term shareholder value and so should promote long-term shareholdings by directors, promoting good agency. And the remuneration committee develop a policy post-employment shareholding. Levels of remuneration for NEDs should reflect the time commitment and responsibilities for the role and they should be in line with the articles of association. Remuneration schemes should include the option to use judgment in share awards and prevent formulaic outcomes. Particularly there must be the option to withhold share awards in situations where it would be inappropriate to award the shares if the, that provision should be there, that ability, that freedom for the remuneration committee should be there, that even something that they have agreed on, if there is unethical or fraudulent or some kind of uh, problem for them to withhold the payment. Let's uh, pay attention to the director's remuneration under good corporate governance. The remuneration committee should address the below considerations when setting up the policy and procedures. It should be clear, clarity. The remuneration should be transparent and help shareholders and employees engage effectively. Simplicity. The remuneration structure should be easy to understand and simple. The remuneration policy should consider the risks such as reputational damage for excessive pay or behavioral implications for performance related pay. Uh, must be identified and mitigated. Predictability. The range of rewards should be made clear to individuals plus any potential for judgment changes. Proportionality. The policy should not reward poor performance and the link between award strategy and long-term company performance should be clear. Alignment to culture. Consideration to the company purpose, values and principles should be incorporated to encourage appropriate behavior. So whatever the remuneration package is determined, it is essential to ensure 
that the director's objective is to do a good job for the stakeholders of the company. So as you can see, clarity, simplicity, risk, predictability, proportionality and alignment to the overall culture. These are all aspects that must be fulfilled and that must be considered when the remuneration committee is deciding the director's remuneration. The remuneration package should be motivational, not too small or too easily earned. And the committee should design a package that attracts, retains and motivates the directors. It should take into account the market rate that is comparable companies remuneration packages before it makes the final decision. Alright, so what are the components that can be included within the director's remuneration? You can have some simple things, basic salary, ERP, performance related pay dependent on the achievement of some KPIs you predetermine, pension contributions, benefits in kind, company car or health insurance etc. And share or stock options, it's an effective way of paying directors and of avoiding short termism as the value of a share should be a reflection of the long term profitability of the company. But in truth, led to managers playing the market and manipulating the share price to benefit themselves. Worldcom incident is actually a good example for manipulation of um, share prices to effect or to rather to benefit owner directors. Yeah, right. There we go. All right. Now we move to looking at uh, the larger uh, corporate governance environment and associating it with some very important uh, segments of the overall risk management system of the company. Firstly, corporate governance and internal controls. So the board is responsible for maintaining a sound system of internal control. In fact, that is like the, uh, the name, the, the label or the phrasing used, exact phrasing used in your co-activity. Uh, reviewing the effectiveness of the internal controls and reporting to shareholders that this review has been carried out. It is the responsibility of management to identify and evaluate the risks faced by the company for consideration by the board. Design and operate and monitor a suitable system of internal control. Now the Turnbull report requires that internal controls should be established using a risk based approach. So, you establish business objectives, identify the associated key risks, decide upon the controls to address those risks and set up a system to implement the required controls including regular feedback. So when you follow through a risk based approach, you can go through uh, these stages. Now let's take a closer look. I know I, I stress on the Turnbull report because uh, the, the crux of this entire discussion, not only this but part of the internal controls segment also uh, is based on the Turnbull report. Now the Turnbull report requires that internal controls should be established using a risk based approach. So in this case, uh, Turnbull suggested that directors should review internal controls under the five headings identified by COSO. That is control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication and monitoring. Right? So these are the five uh, basically features that we will look at in the internal control segment as well. The Turnbull report went on to suggest that internal audit makes a significant and valuable contribution to a company. Should the board become aware at any time of a significant failing or weakness internal control it should determine how the failing or weakness arose and reassess the effectiveness of the management's ongoing process for designing, operating and monitoring the system of internal control. So that is very, very important because if this doesn't work, if it doesn't happen properly, you are directly threatening or you are allowing a situation to threaten the good corporate governance of your company. So reviewing internal controls. Management is accountable to the board for monitoring the system of internal control. The board has a responsibility for reviewing its effectiveness. 
uh, the previous slide. Oh. To review the effectiveness of internal control systems, the board should not rely on the existence of suitable embedded internal control processes. Then what do they do? They should receive regular reports on risks and controls in addition to carrying out an annual assessment. When reviewing reports on internal control, the board should consider the significant risks, how they have been identified, evaluated and managed. Assess the effectiveness of the internal controls for managing each significant risk. Consider whether any controls are weak and action is necessary to strengthen them. So the annual assessment of the system of internal controls should consider a few factors. Uh, it should consider the changes since the assessment carried out in the previous year or the previous assessment. The scope and the quality of management's ongoing monitoring of risks and the system of internal control must be considered. The extent and frequency of the communication of the results of this monitoring to the board, right? the frequency and to what degree, so the level of detail that is provided. The extent and frequency of internal control weaknesses and failings that have been identified during the year and the effectiveness of the company's public reporting processes, all of them should be key considerations when you are assessing the system of internal controls. Now, so we introduced ourselves to the audit function earlier. Now we are going to look at the audit committee uh, in, well, basically very closely. Audit committees were first required under the Cadbury Code and are now required by the UK Corporate Governance Code in response to criticisms of the relationship between the directors and the auditors. So the audit committees are made up of non-executive directors, at least one of which should have recent relevant financial experience and have formal terms of reference. The audit committee should meet at least three times per year and also at least once a year have a meeting with the auditors without the presence of any executive directors. So what are the responsibilities? What do they do? Review the financial statements and any interim reports produced. Review the company's system of internal financial controls. Discussion with the auditors about any significant matters that arose on the audit. Review of the internal audit program and significant findings of the internal auditors. Recommendations on the appointment and removal of the auditors. The setting of the audit fee in discussion with the auditors. Review of the audit report and any management letter provided by the external auditors. Review all the company's internal control and risk management system, unless you delegate it to a risk committee. Uh, ensure that a system is in place for whistleblowing. So, uh, in fact, uh, the audit committee is the committee that has that is given the most amount of prominence in the independent committees. Not to discount the importance of the committees, but uh, as you can see, uh, when you look at the responsibilities themselves, it is very clear that both from the internal perspective, the internal audit angle, the external audit angle, uh, the responsibilities and the scope that the audit committee has to cover are vast and very, very critical. So the audit committee and financial reporting. The key roles of the audit committee are oversight, assessment and review. Please remember those three words, oversight, assessment and review of other functions and systems in the company. The audit committee should review the significant financial reporting issues and judgments in connection with the preparation of the company's financial statements. Management is responsible for preparing the financial statements. The auditors are responsible for preparing the audit plan and carrying out the audit. So actually sometimes uh, we get the copy of the audit internal audit charter which uh, uh, when the pre scene is given in some pre scenes we can see that uh, when we look at the when we go through the live sessions we can take a look at a couple of those um, so this uh, should consider the significant accounting policies that have been used and whether these are appropriate any significant estimates or judgments that have been made and whether these are reasonable the method used to account for any significant or unusual transaction where alternative accounting treatments are 
possible and the clarity and completeness of the disclosures in the financial statements and the committee should listen to the views of the auditors on these matters the meeting where the executive directors are not present and obviously uh, you can have separate meetings where everyone's there obviously right now the audit committee and external auditors how does that relationship the audit committee is responsible for oversight of the company's relations with its external auditors. The audit committee should, in this case, have the primary responsibility for making a recommendation to the board on the appointment, reappointment or removal of the external auditors. Oversee the selection process when new auditors are being considered. Approve, though not necessarily negotiate, the terms of engagement of the external auditors and the remuneration of their audit services have annual procedures for ensuring the independence and objectivity of the external auditors review the scope of the audit with the auditor and satisfy itself that this is sufficient it has to the audit committee must be happy must be satisfied that uh, the work is sufficient make sure that appropriate plans are in place for the audit at the start of each annual audit carry out a post completion audit review Next, we look at the audit committee and internal control. In this case, the audit committee should review the company's internal financial controls, review all the company's internal control and risk management systems, unless the, there is a separate risk committee, uh, give its approval to the statements in the annual report relating to internal control and risk management, receive reports from management about the effectiveness of the control systems it operates. Receive reports on the conclusions of any tests carried out on the controls by the internal or external auditors. So, as you can see, uh, audit committee is like right in the middle of, a, of the action. They are looking at internal audit, internal control, risk management, all of these things, financial uh, controls, etc. There's a lot of power the audit committee holds and a lot of serious responsibilities then we look at the audit committee and internal audit the audit committee should monitor and review the effectiveness of the company's internal audit function now if the company does not have an internal audit function then the committee should consider annually whether there is a need for an internal audit function that is part of the responsibility and make a recommendation to the board the reasons for the absence of an internal audit function should be explained in the relevant section of an annual report and where a company does have an internal audit function then the audit committee should approve the appointment and termination of appointment of the head of the internal audit because the head of the internal audit is the person who directly reports to the uh, uh, chair of the audit committee ensure that the internal auditor has direct access to the board chair and is accountable to the audit committee review and assess the annual internal audit work plan receive a report periodically about the work of the internal auditor review and monitor the response of management to the findings of the internal auditor and monitor and assess the role and effectiveness of the internal audit function within the company's overall risk management system so as you can see again uh, we have the audit committee whether you have internal audit separately established or not playing a fundamental and key role in ensuring that the internal audit function uh, is continuously proceeding within the company. Now, that brings me to uh, the next connection where corporate governance is linked to strategy. So corporate governance is very important to help maximize the effectiveness of an organization's strategy. How it works is to ensure that no individual can dominate the board of directors by ensuring that the CEO and the chair roles are separated as well as the presence of independent NEDs. This helps to ensure that no one is powerful enough to force through inappropriate or ineffective strategy. Also, the NEDs should be able to impartially assess independence, impartially assess whether a proposed strategy is in the best interests of the organization. 
and corporate governance should help to improve the diversity of the board of directors. This allows the board to identify a wide range of possible strategies as well as analyze them from a variety of different viewpoints. Adequate internal audit and control systems should ensure that the board has accurate information about the current operations of the company. Uh, it will enable them to develop more effective strategies for the organization. In addition, strong internal control increases the chance that the organization will be able to implement its strategy successfully. So even in that sense, everything that corporate governance presses on should help the company come up with or implement successful strategy. That's the whole point of corporate governance. So the internal controls, the audit committee, having the NEDs, uh, separating the roles and the responsibilities of the chair and the CEO, everything directs towards sound strategy because sound strategy is what gets a company to where it should be. Uh, and finally, having good corporate governance is attractive to investors. It will make it easier for the organization to raise the funding necessary to invest in the new strategies that they have identified. It is therefore extremely important that companies consider corporate governance principles if they wish to develop and implement successful strategies. So as you can see, uh, in every sense of the word, good corporate governance also not only leads to good strategy, but also uh, is what uh, pulls back because good strategy uh, can cycle back to uh, good governance. Right? Because good strategy means your company can be successful. And if your company can be successful, you can continue on that good governance trajectory, which initially in the first place led to good strategy. Right. Next, we look at corporate governance and corporate social responsibility plus the reporting aspect. PSR provides companies an opportunity to strengthen their business through cost savings, risk mitigation and value enhancement while contributing to society. Now if you look at the CSR report, what it does is, it provides a company with an opportunity to communicate its CSR efforts to the company stakeholders. Why? To discuss within the confines of a single document certain company successes and challenges on a wide array of CSR issues, including corporate governance, climate change, employee and supplier diversity initiatives, community investments and partnerships, etc, etc, etc. So it's, it's informing, transparency, uh, disclosure. Corporate CSR reports address issues most important to each of the company's key stakeholders, like uh, shareholders, addressing the company's business model and corporate governance, including disclosing the role of the board in risk management, sustainability reporting, and in evaluating CSR performance. So it's, it's actually getting the shareholders to be more interested in all these areas. Employees addressing diversity, health, safe, health and safety, training and mentoring, employee relations and wages and benefits. Customers addressing customer service and privacy. Suppliers, addressing labor standards and whether suppliers are required to implement their own CSR program. Communities, addressing corporate philanthropy and charitable contributions, community investments and partnerships, volunteerism and the environmental impact of operations. Then governments and regulators, that is addressing lobbying, public policy and the effects of and compliance with environmental regulation, other regulation. So this is what corporate CSR reports enables us to uh, do in terms of informing all these different types of stakeholders, shareholders, employees, customers, suppliers, communities, governments and regulators, etc. Other considerations with respect to CSR. So there are a few important elements. One is the CEO responsibility and board oversight. The CEO should ultimately be responsible for establishing 
effective communications with the company stakeholders with CSR oversight by the board or the board committee or multiple committees. Focus on impact. Companies should focus on the CSR issues that may have the greatest impact on them and their operations and finances. So sort of prioritization. Stock exchange reporting initiatives. There is a global effort by certain groups including investors to mobilize stock exchanges to adopt a listing requirement regarding sustainability reporting. So currently it's not a mandate but there is a global effort and slowly starting to take shape. Then identify the corporate team. Companies should identify the corporate team that will be responsible for their CSR reports and include at a minimum employees from their investor, public, community relations, legal, compliance, regulatory and human resource department. So having that solid, uh, intelligent and workable corporate team is important. Then other components of stakeholder engagement. The CSR report is only one component of an effective stakeholder engagement strategy. Other components may include supplementary records. For example, carbon disclosure protection, regulatory filing, the annual meeting of shareholders, and, you know, meeting minutes, etc. And the direct dialogue with the stakeholders. All of these can be included in the CSR report. It's actually the extent to which you prefer to go in informing all the different stakeholders of the things that you have done that relate to uh, social responsibility. That extent, that decision is what will decide uh, the extent to which you report all this information. Then we look at international developments of corporate governance. So, so far we've looked at so many elements and all of these things have been predominantly governed by the UK's corporate code of governance. Now we want to uh, take a brief look at uh, international developments. So, post Endon and World Commission in the USA to restore confidence in the results of US-based companies, the Sarbanes Oxley Act was introduced. A little more um, rigid than the UK corporate code of governance. The SOX legislation, Sarbid SOX Act, is extremely detailed and carries the full force of the law behind it. That also includes requirements for the securities and exchange commission, issued certain rules on corporate governance. It is relevant to US companies, directors of subsidiaries of US listed businesses, and auditors who are working on US listed what are the differences between the US code and the UK code? One is enforcement. The UK code is a series of voluntary codes, which is something we denote as principle-based approach. Whereas Sarbanes Oxley takes a robust legislative approach, which sets out clear personal responsibility for some company directors with a series of criminal offenses that are punishable by fines both company and its officers or lengthy jail sentences, which we call a rule based approach. So there is a mandate here. There are no rules. And the Securities Exchange Commission, the US based uh, SEC, has very, very clear cut requirements in terms of uh, disclosures. And that is why uh, the 10K annual report is uh, 10 case and the 12 case the US disclosures are so detailed because they are mandated by the Sarbanes Oxley Act. Uh, documentation SOX creates um, in terms of documentation SOX creates a much more rigorous demand for evidence in internal controls and having them audited. What are the key highlights? These are the key highlights of the Sarbanes Oxley Act. One audit committee. The company must have an audit committee. It will be disallowed from trading if it does not have one. The internal control report. The annual report must include statements concerning the internal control systems in the company. The famous section 404. Then the certification of accuracy of financial statements must be checked. It must be vouched for by the CEO and the CFO. Signed by the government. financial report. The financial report must detail of balance sheet must provide very detailed note. 
Restrictions on dealing. Directors are prohibited from dealing in shares at sensitive times. Audit partner. Senior partner, the, the definition for sensitive times provided in the act. Uh, you can look at the act in detail if you want to understand it. The audit partner, the senior audit partner must be changed every five years, not be the same, uh, same entity. Then the auditor independence. The auditor, uh, auditors are restricted in the additional services they can provide to an audit client. Unlike certain other jurisdictions. So these are the key highlights and as you can see they are more rigid and more rigorous because if you really think about it, most of the poor management and you know, most of the failures, corporate failures all were, almost all, most at least uh, originated from the United States. And finally we arrive at the modern lines of thought as far as corporate governance is concerned. Now you will see the shift of uh, this corporate profit to corporate value. So stakeholder engagement includes the formal and informal ways company stays connected to its stakeholders. That is the individuals or parties that have an actual or potential interest in or impact on the company, its operations and financial results. So stakeholders often have the ability to influence the success or failure of a company at various levels. Companies tend to recognize certain value associated with stakeholder engagement to help drive long-term sustainability and shareholder value. That is why you see a lot of things going on, especially in today's terms, because the customer is empowered and the customer is also have, has become very powerful because they can drive corporate value and companies have recognized it. Then rise in shareholder activism. Shareholder activism on CSR issues especially continues to rise necessity now i would i have reservations on this but uh, to a certain degree it's bigger than what it used to be uh, this necessitates further engagement between companies and their shareholders and other stakeholders related stakeholder concerns can be proactively discussed and addressed companies may be able to avert a potentially costly and prolonged proxy fight and relationships between companies and their stakeholders may be nurtured and finally, the rise in sustainable and responsible investing. Stakeholder engagement and understanding and addressing stakeholder CSR concerns have become specially important as shareholders and potential investors are increasingly evaluating CSR issues when they analyze investment decisions. Under sustainable and responsible investing, with SRI principles, investors apply various CSR criteria in their investment analysis. So it's not pure NPV analysis that is going on at the moment. Uh, there are sustainability angles that are being incorporated to the by and large major financial evaluations that we do when you evaluate certain investments. And those uh, basically cover the modern lines of thought, the modern thinking that is becoming slowly incorporated into corporate governance aspects. And that marks the end of the segment. This very crucial segment on corporate governance. We looked at so many important elements. Uh, first, we understood what corporate governance means, what the expectation surrounding good corporate governance is, uh, the importance of it, and uh, a quick history, the Turnbull report, etc. Uh, then we looked at the principles of corporate governance. There were five, leadership, effectiveness, accountability, remuneration, and the state shareholder relationship. Then we look at certain details, right? The relationship, corporate governance, or rather the role internal controls, audit committee, and subsidiarily the risk committee, and the disclosure aspects that are incorporated within corporate governance. Finally, we looked at international developments uh, that have taken place, especially with the Sarbanes Oxley Act. That uh, marks a clear end corporate governance. It was quite detailed and provides you a complete summary of what you need for corporate governance. And as you know, do keep learning and uh, enjoy the process. As I always say, uh, I hope this has been a very productive segment for you that you have a very sound understanding of what corporate governance is, how to manage it, how to tackle it. So uh, continue absorbing the content. Happy learning and uh, thank you very much.
ladies and gentlemen.